because Canada is held in very high regard. Is that enough to calm fears about trade? Tensions rise at Syrian peace talks, what they could mean for Russia's sphere of influence. Illegal pot stores targeted for robbery. Employees and customers have been stabbed, pistol whipped and pepper sprayed. But calling police can be tricky. Plus, dancing with Parkinson's. I think the benefit to dance is that it's using your brain too. Researchers try to measure the magic. They've spoken by phone. The Prime Minister has extolled the friendship and trade relationship between Canada and the U.S. And soon, Justin Trudeau will get to make his case in person to Donald Trump. The White House says Trudeau and the Mexican president will be guests there in the next 30 days. So no surprise that trade was top of the agenda today at the Liberal Cabinet Retreat in Calgary or that a top Trump economic advisor was top draw. Katie Simpson has more. In a city that has felt firsthand the painful effects of Canada's sluggish economy, welcome news emerged from the Prime Minister's Calgary cabinet retreat. We have balanced trade between the U.S. and Canada, and that's not the kind of situation where you should be worrying not only did Donald Trump's top economic advisor praise Canada-U.S. trade, but he also suggested Canadian energy companies may be exempt from any border tax the new administration comes up with. The reassurance comes as the government uses its first retreat of the year to find ways to work with President Trump. Our uh, goal, of course, uh, with the U.S. administration will be to engage, to, uh, to ensure that we have a very strong relationship so that we can uh, put forth the interests of Canadians. It appears protecting those interests could prompt a shift in Canada's trading policy. We will cooperate on trilateral matters when it's in our interest and we'll be, we'll be looking to do uh, things that are in our interest bilaterally also. Canada's ambassador to the U.S. suggested yesterday the government should be less concerned about Mexico and focus more on a deal with the Americans. The new foreign minister wouldn't confirm a strategy and praised both trading partners, but she was quick to add. But of course, our relationship with the United States is primarily a bilateral relationship, and I think Canadians know and understand that. And with Trump officially killing the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal today, Canada's new trade minister says bilateral deals may be the way of the future. We want to send a message that Canada is open to trade, uh, obviously with China, with India, with Japan. Um, I had meetings with my counterparts, so we're going to be considering our options. Another top Trump advisor, Jared Kushner, who may have the most direct line to the president as his son-in-law, was supposed to arrive at the retreat tomorrow. But there is much disappointment here as disorganization on the U.S. side has ended up nixing the trip. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Calgary. Trump clearly wants to be tough on trade, but if Canadians who support free trade are concerned he'll kill NAFTA, like he did the TPP today, there's a different reality. We will either renegotiate it or we will break it. We need fair trade, not free trade. We will follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American. For more than a few countries, that's scary talk. But the facts could see Canada come out ahead. First, we do buy American goods, almost as much as we sell to them. In fact, Canada is the second largest trading partner for the U.S., behind China and ahead of Mexico. But here's what Trump sees as the problem. America buys much more from those countries than they do from the U.S. Huge trade deficits that make China and Mexico bigger potential targets. They are our partners in the future that we are trying to make together. It's worth pointing out, after two decades, the tide of NAFTA has lifted all boats. Trade activity has boomed for all partners, but it's an agreement from a different era. The NAFTA is a quarter century old, so the economy has fundamentally changed. The digital economy didn't exist, so for all of those Canadians who are working in the United States under NAFTA visas or free trade visas, you know, it's kind of hard to get across the border if you're in the digital economy. So an updated agreement could benefit Canada. But given Trump's desire to show he's a tough negotiator, 
and that he's winning for Americans, a renewed NAFTA may require a delicate touch. I wouldn't want to see Canada get uh, identified in a late night tweet either. I think that could be very damaging. So uh, I, I think uh, the way Canada has been proceeding as, as a helpful fixer, as an ally, uh, keeping its powder dry has been a really good approach. Well, despite the more reassuring words in Calgary today, people who work in Alberta's main industry are still worried about what it could mean for them. In the short term, the Trump administration may be good for the oil industry. But as Briar Stewart heard today, some worry the good won't last. On the floor of the shop in Nisku, Alberta, employees make and repair machine parts for the energy industry. But the sagging price of oil has cut the workforce here in half. And now there's some more uncertainty on the horizon. It's going to be only America first. Just what will a Donald Trump presidency mean for the energy sector? Canada's one of the top exporters for 35 different states. So if there's a big change down there, it's going to affect us totally. In 2015, 40% of the petroleum imported by the United States came from Canada. But the U.S. isn't only our biggest customer, it's also our biggest competitor. Trump has signaled that his administration is going to ramp up domestic production relax rules and roll back environmental regulations. That has caught the attention of energy producers here. For a U.S. oil and gas producer just south of the border from us, right now I think uh, they're feeling pretty optimistic. It does mean that Canadian producers will be concerned about our ability to compete for investment dollars. Well, it's believed that Canada's energy sector won't be the main target of Trump's protectionist posturing. There will be implications. And some believe that's been overshadowed by the overall outrageousness of the American election campaign. I think people have not taken it as seriously as they need to. Dave Hancock is a former premier of Alberta and now works with a multinational law firm. He spent the last week in Washington and tomorrow is part of a sold-out talk on what businesses can expect from the Trump administration. I think the homework hasn't been done. I, I, don't, I think the federal government needs to actually uh, step up its pace and engage. Um, I think that there's work to be done even from the business level. I think it's a, a recognition that people didn't really have the expectation that they were going to be facing quite what they're facing. But just what exactly the Canadian energy industry is facing is still uncertain. While there is concern, there's also optimism. Trump, after all, is pro-business and has previously said that if elected, he'd approve the Keystone XL pipeline. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Edmonton. There's been an oil pipeline leak in southeastern Saskatchewan. About 200,000 litres of crude spilled onto agricultural land just north of Stoughton. A Saskatchewan government spokesperson says the oil did not get into any creeks or streams. Pipeline owner Tundra Energy Marketing is handling the cleanup. About 170,000 litres have been recovered. His weekend statement to the press about the size of the inauguration crowds has been called everything from a lie to an alternative fact. And Sean Spicer didn't stick around to defend it. But today, the Trump spokesman was back in the briefing room, and this time he took questions, and one went something like this. Will you always tell the truth from that podium? Paul Hunter now on where it went from there. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out to our first official briefing. Here Donald Trump's room. press secretary today uh, might well have said, here's to new beginnings. After all, it had been a rocky start for Sean Spicer's relationship with White House reporters. At an impromptu briefing Saturday night, he described Trump swearing in this way. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. Almost immediately, up popped photos of Barack Obama's inauguration in 09 and the same view of Trump's on Friday. Reporters counted four other untruths by Spicer. Even the Dallas Stars took a shot at a claim Trump himself had made about the inaugural. Then, yesterday, to a gobsmacked journalist, Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway offered an explanation. Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains... Alternative that facts? There's... Crowdgate, as it's, of course, been dubbed may seem trivial, but critics underline honesty is imperative 
for those who speak for the president. So, to that first official briefing today, and a question rarely asked of any presidential spokesperson. Is it your intention to always tell the truth from that podium? Yes, I believe that we have to be honest with the American people. I think sometimes we can disagree with the facts. Spicer stood by his earlier comments, clarifying that by crowd, he meant worldwide, on TV and online, adding, he states facts as understood at the time. Pressed on why Trump even cares about the size of his crowd, a strong hint the president's frustrated by the tone of his news coverage broadly. It's not about one tweet. It's not about one picture. It's about a constant theme. It's about sitting here every time and being told, no, well, we don't think he can do that. He'll never accomplish that. He can't win that. It won't be the biggest. Famously, America's first president, George Washington, is said to have once uttered, I cannot tell a lie. Spicer didn't quite say that today. But our intention is never to lie to you, Jonathan. But it was close. Our job is to make sure that Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump has brushed off a new lawsuit being filed against him, calling it without merit. A group of constitutional scholars, Supreme Court litigators, and former White House ethics lawyers says Trump is violating a clause in the Constitution by continuing to accept payments from foreign governments at his hotels and other businesses. Earlier this month, Trump announced he would retain ownership of his businesses, but turn over operations to his oldest sons. Former President George H.W. Bush is out of intensive care. The 92-year-old is suffering from pneumonia and last week required a ventilator to breathe. Meanwhile, former First Lady Barbara Bush has been discharged from the same hospital. She was being treated for bronchitis. Coming up, new research gives Parkinson's patients a compelling reason to get on their feet. So it's like doing brain training with dance. And memories of a school shooting. Your belly just drops like you're just like stuck, like you're in fear. One year later, Lalosh, Saskatchewan, still has barriers to healing. Members of the Syrian government and rebel factions met face to face today in Kazakhstan. It was the first of two days of discussions aimed at solidifying a ceasefire. But as senior correspondent Susan Ormiston explains, the peace talks began with a war of words. Astana, the frigid capital of Kazakhstan, did not encourage warm relations between two of the warring sides in Syria. In Syria. For the first time, commanders of opposition rebels stared tensely across the table at Syrian government negotiators. Not surprisingly, things got testy, as Syria's government spokesperson called the other side terrorists. We came to Astana to succeed. We will not be part of any maneuver aiming at torpedoing the meeting of Astana. Provoking this response from an opposition spokesperson. Those people are not terrorists. Those people are just, they can rightfully be called freedom fighters. They didn't hold or they didn't carry arms willingly or uh, uh, like a hobby. They defended themselves. For its part, the rebels accused government forces of breaking a month-long truce brokered by Russia and Turkey, tattered now in areas like Homs, but holding in others. In the wake of Syria and Russia seizing Aleppo, Russia is looking for a breakthrough, both to disentangle itself from the military solution and keep a central political role. I think that Russia has a chance, but only it has a chance, not more. If Russia keeps Bashar, if Russia keeps some Syria, keeps its presence, and political and military presence in Syria, it means that Russia is able to be present in the Middle East and it's able, capable to perform a role of big power. Contribution to After its rocky beginning, the talks did continue and will Syria. return tomorrow, igniting even a sliver of hope for progress. What would that look like? Putting rebars under a ceasefire, extending it, possibly agreeing to political talks next month in Geneva. But this is a long and delicate negotiation, focusing on Syria's civil war, 
now going into its sixth year. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Moscow. The mayor of London today called the air in his city filthy. Air pollution is at its highest level in five years. There are similar conditions in Paris, where a high pollution warning has been extended for tomorrow. Cold, calm conditions are being blamed for the smog. Record-breaking rains have caused flash flooding in Southern California. The West Coast has been inundated by three powerful storms. So much rain fell yesterday, it swept away cars. The driver escaped from this vehicle unharmed. And it was another dangerous night in the southern United States. At least 29 tornadoes formed over the weekend, causing widespread damage. The storms are being blamed for the deaths of at least 20 people. Chances are you've been approached in a store and asked to apply for a credit card. But now some Canadians are telling CBC News they were tricked into signing up for a PC Financial MasterCard. And sales staff hired to push the plastic are also speaking out about the tactics they say they were pressured to use. Here's Erica Johnson. They worked inside Loblaws stores, hired to get customers to sign up for a PC Financial MasterCard. Uh, I spoke with somebody over the phone for, for maybe two minutes, and then I was selling the very next day financial products, which I've never, you know, looked into before. Hired by SDI Marketing, paid commission to deliver credit card applications. They say managers often pressured them to sign up 50 people a shift. If those goals were not met, uh, they would question us and pressure us to get those sales by whatever it means necessary. Workers would approach customers, say they were just offering PC points or bags of cookies if they answered a few questions. They say managers told them not to mention they were actually applying for a credit card. Workers tell Go Public they were also encouraged to target young people, like Brooke Ansel, told she was just getting a PC rewards card. If you're going to provide a credit card, you need to say that from the beginning because um, if I knew that they were going to give me a credit card, I would have said absolutely not right away. Workers say managers also told them to target low-income people who might not ask why they have to show ID. These people are the last people in society that need to be hit with a credit hit. It did uh, initially affect my morals, but eventually it just fades away and you make money. This insider says he was under so much pressure he'd sometimes fake signatures on credit card applications, a violation of the Bank Act. I'm not the only one, and uh, I can guarantee you uh, probably, oh, I know for a fact other reps do that. Banks like PC Financial are making big profits on credit cards. In 2015, Canadians owed $77 billion on their plastic. This consumer watchdog says freebies have no place when sales staff are pushing plastic. Because it's financial services, it's not, um, you know, uh, it's not candy bars or widgets. It's important to consumers. It can cost them a lot of money. So that puts another level of uh, importance to how they sell. Neither PC Financial nor SDI Marketing would give an interview, but in emails, both companies said workers pushing plastic have recently been required to be retrained and sign a code of ethics. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. And if you have a story you want our Go Public team to investigate, get in touch. Send us an email at gopublic at cbc.ca. A Calgary woman who treated her son with herbal remedies before he died has been found guilty of criminal negligence causing death. Tamara Lovett's seven-year-old son died in 2013 after coming down with a strep infection. During the trial, Lovett testified she gave the boy dandelion tea and oil of oregano instead of taking him to a doctor. The judge issued a stay on a second charge of failing to provide the necessaries of life. Canada's military ombudsman is warning that the Canadian Rangers don't have adequate access to health care services and lack sufficient support staff. Those findings are part of an ongoing investigation into Canada's Far North Patrol units. The Rangers are part of the Canadian Armed Forces Reserve. They are part-time volunteers from the remote communities they serve. There were picket lines across Nova Scotia today to mark one year since workers at Canada's oldest independently owned newspaper became locked in a labour dispute. 61 newsroom staff at the Chronicle Herald walked off the job last January over a contract proposal that included wage cuts. 
As marijuana dispensaries continue to crop up in cities across Canada, police are warning that the stores have become a target for armed robbers. The dispensaries deal mostly in cash and are still illegal in most places, so some business owners are reluctant to report the violent crimes. Here's Ron Charles. Security cameras captured this violent robbery last October of a Vancouver pot dispensary. Four people, one armed with a shotgun, stole thousands of dollars in cash and cannabis products, at one point punching an employee. Staff at the municipally licensed dispensary called police after the alleged robbers fled. Contrast that to Toronto, where police say only half of dispensary robberies in the city have been reported to police by owners. Most people would assume that if people are running in there with guns, assaulting people, firing shots, that the police were going to be notified. That's a common sense conclusion. He says even after customers or other witnesses reported the crimes, some dispensary owners and staff still refuse to cooperate with police. I find it disturbing that the owners and operators of these storefronts refuse to cooperate, turn over evidence, and instruct their employees not to call the police or speak to the police after they become victimized. Medical marijuana advocates say the reason for that might be the police raids last spring of several dispensaries. Products were seized, employees arrested and charged. The advocates say those raids and Toronto's refusal to license dispensaries are what's led to the robberies. Add to that, bank and credit card companies refuse to deal with dispensaries, leaving the storefronts with tens of thousands of dollars in cash on hand any given day. The issue is the prohibition. So as long as cannabis is illegal, as long as dispensaries are illegal, criminals are going to feel like they have impunity. At Toronto's Bellwoods Dispensary, staff member Sasha Suderich says if the shop were ever robbed, she would call the police. I would never hesitate to help the police. They've been through the door and whenever they have, they've had our full attention. And we've always cooperated with them. Um, I would never change that. But at the same time, police say storefront dispensaries are still illegal and they will continue to seize cannabis products if they find any in the course of investigating robberies at the cannabis shops. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Straight ahead, unraveling a medical mystery. Why Parkinson's patients have something to dance about.
Dancing provides them enjoyment, it provides them interactions with other people, it provides them beauty. Um, I think there's a lot of value in that. More than 100,000 Canadians live with Parkinson's disease, and that number grows every day. A diagnosis brings the alarming prospect of slowly losing physical control. But get this, the leading edge weapon against that decline may be one of humanity's most primal activities, dancing in groups. Researchers want to learn why it makes Parkinson's patients feel so much better, and if it maybe does much more than that. Joanna Remiliotis looked into the medicine of movement. Will you dance with me? Here the invitation the to dance comes with one to forget why they're here. And sometimes it happens. Dance around the room. Sometimes 60-year-old Charles Dennis gets lost in a rhythm until he remembers how desperately he wants to keep moving. I find myself really getting up, caught up in the music, and you can forget about, you forget about having to make the movement to be sure that your arm is getting the message from your brain to move this way. They don't know what causes it. It'd be, it'd be great to be part of the victory over it. Ole, take your there is no cure for Parkinson's a neurological disorder where the ability to move degenerates over time. But something about dancing seems to help. And until now, science couldn't begin to explain why. Why damaged signals from brain to limb suddenly seem to connect. Anecdotally, what the students tell us and what we see is that maybe, you know, new neural pathways are being created to movement because people sometimes who come in walking with walkers and are very unstable, halfway through the class will start waltzing through the room. Sarah Robichaud has been running Dancing with Parkinson's classes in the Toronto area for nearly a decade. When researchers asked to turn her class into a science experiment, no one said no. They love doing research. Um, the people who come to these classes, I can tell you, they are so open and so courageous and so willing to do anything that will help themselves and help others with the progression of this disease. So whatever they can do, they will do it to, um, to help. Okay, Charles, so we're gonna start with putting the EEG cap on your head. Okay. Charles Dennis was diagnosed a year ago and is willing to try anything that helps. It's why he's part of this the first study of its kind that is scanning the brains of people with Parkinson's immediately before and after a one-hour dance class. It was just like, well, there's two things you can do. You can either work with what you've got or you can just lay down and let it win. And that sounded really boring. Um, I wanted to try and do what I could. And, you know, there's that <clears throat> kind of hope in your mind that, well, I'll keep fighting this, and then the big cure will just, you know, they'll find the answer, and then you, you're there. And if you gave up six months too early, you'd be done. Raise your arms directly in front of you with lots of space between your fingers. There's no real treatment for Parkinson's, other than medication to help with tremors that set in. But researchers from Toronto's York University believe dance can rebuild the brain's pathways, the ones that tell the body to move. And they're out to prove it. Joseph D'Souza is the neuroscientist leading the study. I think the benefit to dance is that it's using your brain too. So you're remembering cognitive steps in time, usually to an external stimulus of music or a piano you'll hear in, the, in, the, in this set. And what's great about it is all these things are very cognitive, cognitively demanding. And so it's like doing brain training with dance. When she's not in class, Alice Betty Rustin practices in the hallway. Her apartment is too small. Every exaggerated shuffle and swing is hard work. Rustin found out she has Parkinson's five years ago. So the dancing has helped you physically? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, and it has helped me mentally and emotionally. Not just emotionally, but mentally as well. How so? Well, because 
when you're when you're dancing or when you're doing steps or or even arm movements you have to think about it it, it just doesn't come naturally so that's that's good for me it becomes like uh, like a teacher a self teacher when I'm on my own in three, two, one, go! 25 Canadians are diagnosed with Parkinson's every day the risk increases as people age. Thank you, thank you. As fate would have it, Rustin has been an advocate for years. She got involved when her father-in-law was diagnosed decades ago. Okay, here we go, I'll just be outside. Never thinking one day she would be part of the search for answers. We're not gonna progress in finding out how, how Parkinson starts or why Parkinson starts or, or are we ever going to find a cure? Are we ever going to find better treatments? All those things can't happen if we don't have patients like me who, who give, give them data to work with. There is evidence already that exercise, especially strenuous activity, builds muscle and brain power in people with Parkinson's. Dennis works out regularly and while all this makes him stronger, he's convinced dancing does something more. I feel like I'm smoother in things that I do. Um, I have an easier time in the dance with knowing that my brain is sending the message to move in this, and that my arm, my arm is gonna move the way my brain tells it to. The goal would be for my movement to be natural to not have to think about it, to not have to go, okay, I need to move this far and then change my arm and go like this. It should just be able to do that. Okay. Everything go well today? The data day on dancing day. is preliminary and promising. Everyone's progress has been pooled together over the last three years. And D'Souza recently presented his early findings at an international conference on Parkinson's. Perfect. He's found a one hour dance class results in a boost in alpha brain waves that renewed brain activity may explain why most volunteers show an improvement in their balance and gait. The question now, can the effects last? So we want to see whether it's a neuroprotective thing that's happening as a function of dance. So we're not only interested in what's happening in the brain, but how it's happening and whether it's neuroprotective over time. Heel, toe, stop. D'Souza's research is still in its infancy, and there are only about 50 people in his study. But what he's learned so far is already informing experts in the field. I think we have to keep pushing the envelope. You know, we can't just be content with a, a, a sort of status quo. It's not adequate. People with Parkinson's are suffering. We've got to find ways. We, we can't stop and wait. And you're not having any side effects from the medication. Dr. Yeah. Galit Kleiner runs the Movement Disorder Clinic at Toronto's Baycrest Hospital. So She's on top of all the medical interventions that help her patients. Yes, but she also pioneers the use of other therapies, too. Okay, go ahead. This exoskeleton suit robotically Good. facilitates movement. The external cues fire off messages to the brain to get legs moving, not unlike what dancing does. We know that there's sort of an internal rhythm in all of us, but especially in Parkinson's disease, that rhythm is impaired. Um, the motor circuits of actually moving are intact, but the accessing those circuits may not be intact. And so music and even uh, um, pacing with a metronome may be able to access those motor pathways. Okay, and stay there. Kleiner and says stay. there aren't huge clinical Good, trials to draw on so to prove how well non-medical therapies yeah. work. And she's and not waiting for them. Bigger, she there. recommends dancing to her patients because it seems to help and already proves it gives people hope. So that's huge, you know, all of us need hope, all of us need to be uh, socially integrated, uh, to be accepted. Um, I think when you live with a neurodegenerative condition, especially like Parkinson's, which is so visible, people increasingly become socially isolated. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to cope. Dancing provides them enjoyment, it provides them interactions with other people, it provides them beauty. I think there's a lot of value in that. I think that's a key to coping and living with a chronic illness. For Dennis, that illness is still an unfamiliar and frightening companion, but he clings to what the study may still reveal. Pass my thanks around the room. Researchers want to follow the class for at least five more years to see if dancing actually halts 
the progression of the disease. There's a saying that with Parkinson's that you don't die of Parkinson's, you die with it. So you want to, I want to maintain as long as I can. And, you know, if I'm part of that cure or advancement, why wouldn't I want to be? Why wouldn't I want to do that? It is so often a dance between hope and despair. But coming here, Dennis says, is an exercise of faith, whether or not the science follows. And now, more courtesy to your partner. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Yay. Thank you, guys. You can learn more about this tomorrow when Joanna hosts a live Facebook chat. She'll be joined by a medical specialist and one of the patients from her story. Like us on Facebook and join in the conversation. We'll kick it off a little after noon Eastern time. Up next, memories of a deadly school shooting. The shooter was in the back area where my office was. So when you're hearing gunshots, you are thinking, okay, is that door of mine going to be opened? One year later, the people of La Loche, Saskatchewan still can't get all the help they need. Plus, home for the holidays in China. All it takes is billions of trips.
A school in the northern Saskatchewan village of La Loche was closed today in honor of those who lost their lives in a shooting rampage in the community a year ago. Four people were killed and seven others were wounded. Now, some of the people who were touched by tragedy that day are telling their stories to our Carolyn Dunn. I heard a shot. One shot was, was distant and I, then I've got, okay, I, there is a shooter in the building. Everything in you and your heart and your belly just drops, like you're just like stuck, like you're in fear. It was around lunchtime when I got a call uh, just later in lunch that uh, there had been a shooting and it was still ongoing. It was a shooting rampage in the village of La Loche, a remote Dene community in northwestern Saskatchewan. Teen brothers Dane and Drayden Fontaine had already been shot to death in their home. Then the 17-year-old shooter made his way to the local high school. School principal Greg Hatch was working as an administrator at the time. As a staff member went by in my office and said, uh, they said there's a shooter in the building, he closed my door. My teacher, he turned off the lights and he locked it and we all went into a corner. Like, I wasn't sure what was happening. And I heard another shot that was just outside the door that you could actually hear the shell casing drop out of the, out of the gun. Now, then I went, is my door locked? People were like on their like electronics, like we have, like they're getting text messages, like what, what was going on in the school. You are thinking, okay, is that door of mine going to be opened? So, you know, you're, uh, you're wondering if you're actually going to get out of there. I thought I was going to like legitly die. So I was like really scared. So when, and then I started watching my favorite show. I was like, I'd rather die watching something I like. The gunman continued his shooting spree. Frantic calls poured into the police. RCMP Inspector Teddy Monroe was the incident commander. One member was the first on the scene, so he went in. He went in, uh, obviously, and then the other two members arrived shortly after in their own vehicle and went in to support him. They started to complete the lockdown and located the individual uh, in one of the washrooms and he was arrested without incident. But with unthinkable carnage in his wake, nine people had been shot in the school. Teacher's aide Marie Janvier was dead, teacher Adam Wood died in hospital, and seven others were seriously wounded. Annette Montgrand's granddaughter, Taylor Haino, was one of them. The retiree had already lost one son and a sister to violence, and that day she bargained for Taylor's life. I prayed and prayed. I even talked to, I even talked to people that had passed on, like her dad and to me and some of my friends, pleading with them that if, if her spirit is out there with them, please send her back. Taylor survived, but she, like so many others here, is still not able to speak publicly about what happened that day, only of her grandmother's support. She's there for me when no one isn't. And she believes in me when no one does. A year ago, this community was grieving, but still numb. Now the depths of their wounds are clear. The road to recovery is long. A road many here feel they are walking alone. Despite good intentions and government support, money for infrastructure and services from both the Saskatchewan and federal governments, many of the essential services simply aren't available in the Loche. A lack of housing means a lack of qualified experts who can live in the community. And at school, unmistakable signs of trauma linger. We have students that are definitely struggling. It's, uh, you know, we're you know, attendance, um, the marks, uh, grades, yeah, absolutely. Hatch says what's missing in his school is a comprehensive holistic education and healing plan that's based in the Dene culture. They need to, to come in and, and be here and uh, be visible um, and uh, ask what we need, uh, but also be there to support and provide expertise. Brilanda Montgrand says she still has down times, but it is getting better. She copes the same way she did while huddled in that classroom, by escaping reality in Harry Potter and Captain America movies. It's pretty, like, pretty tough, but you gotta, like, you gotta, like, try to go out of your box, like, so you can, like, heal and get better. Annette Montgrand lives the reality of her trauma, just 
not out loud most yeah. of the time. It's just not appropriate to ask how you're doing because you're really not going to get an honest answer. Even if you were honest, what could people really do to help you? A question still looking for an answer. One year on. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, La Loche, Saskatchewan. Change of pace coming up next. It's a bad week for traveling in China. Why so many millions are on the move. A week of mayhem has begun in China. Roads, train stations, and airports are all jam-packed with everyone trying to get somewhere and no one going anywhere fast. It's all ahead of the Spring Festival, or what's widely known here as Chinese New Year. Sasha Petrasek shows us just how busy it gets from Beijing. It's been called the greatest annual human migration in the world, or more simply in China, the big spring transport. 
3 billion journeys by train, plane, ship and car over a month-long period as migrant workers make their annual pilgrimage home. It's always like this, says Yang Xiaohui, who's traveling to rural Henan province. I just hope I can get a ticket. He's one of hundreds of thousands streaming through Beijing's railway stations today, where the scene was pretty orderly considering the 93 million trips across China just on Monday. That's well over twice the population of Canada. Many trains are sold out. The voyage home coincides with the country's most important holiday, Chinese New Year. That's Saturday of this week. But across China already, cities have been outdoing one another with light shows and celebrations marking the year of the rooster. Last year, more than 100,000 travelers were stranded in railway stations in southern China as bad weather threw the train system into chaos. Liu Jingfeng is hoping for better this year. The crowds are not terrible here, he says, but I'm not home yet. China's big cities, including Beijing, have been a magnet for the rural unemployed for decades. Workers in the countryside make up more than 20 percent of the urban population, though that number is always in flux. And despite China's slowing economy and regulations meant to keep more people in their home provinces, the Great Migration continues. Sasha Petrosek, CBC News, Beijing. Increasingly, more Chinese are celebrating the new year outside of the country. China's largest online travel agency estimates 6 million people will travel internationally this week to escape the cold and the travel madness. All that travel can bring on jet lag. Coming up, we've got the latest wisdom on how it affects some pro athletes. But first, let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX dropped 67 points. The dollar went up a third of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 27 points and the price of oil closed up 47 cents a barrel. I'm Connie Walker. Tomorrow on The Current, a new study says more and more older working Canadians are redefining retirement by seeking a second or third career to begin a new chapter in life. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1.
I would never send her a picture of my penis. Of course not, James. I mean, she wishes she saw my penis. We all wish we saw your penis. Not following too closely in her footsteps. We're drinking to be not becoming an alcoholic. Well, here's an excuse the next time your baseball team flames out. Researchers at Northwestern University are connecting jet lag to player performance. They found surprising results after studying close to 5,000 games where players crossed at least two time zones. Players traveling from west to east almost always played worse. And playing at home doesn't necessarily mean an advantage. The study suggests that a team jet lag from the road suffers a drop in hitting performance. Well, here's a look at something special we have for tomorrow. Two, one, boost mission and liftoff of the space shuttle to It was 25 years ago that Dr. Roberta Bonder made history, blasting off as Canada's first female astronaut. Uh, we've had a great deal of science accomplished so far. Even today, she's still inspiring children. Yes, all hands on deck. And still exploring. This is the photography club. Red Sharon gets a taste of that experience. <laughs> oh my, I like it. Then. But we thought of something that would be a little different. She takes questions from some VIP colleagues of hers. Roberta, a question, if you will. They remembered me, did That's tomorrow <laughs> on The National. It's good fun, too. That's The National for this Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.